So what I want to do here is to continue from what we've been doing throughout this week in terms of planning and looking at uh, ideas around the hip joint and the issues that we need to consider when we're doing um, proximal femoral osteotomies. Um, so a little bit about biomechanics and geometric principles. Um, the aims of reconstruction, if we're going to reconstruct the hip joint, we just think about what we're going to do and how we're going to achieve this. You want to improve the symptoms in your patients. You want to maintain an impingement-free range of motion. And obviously impingement is a fairly new concept, often done arthroscopically. But you still also need to think about muscle power around the hip because this translates into an energy efficient gait, hopefully giving an acceptable life work function. But also remember that there may be other operations to be done in the future, particularly hip replacement, um, and then you don't want to compromise that hip replacement. So I think the key points um, really is um, you need a, cor a correlation of the history and the clinical findings with the imaging of your patient and you correlate it with a patient's complaints, which is extremely Im important. These days with this new femoral acetabular impingement diagnosis and labral diagnosis being made, a lot of patients come to my clinic with a labral tear. And I've had a 16-year-old with a labral tear who had metastatic uh, osteosarcoma of the pelvis that had been missed. Um, so you need to correlate all these things together with the patient. It's very important and don't just jump to the new um, latest diagnosis. Then you need to generate a surgical tactic which is based on your history, your clinical findings, correlated with imaging and the patient's complaints in order to obtain the goals that we just talked about just now. So I think there are probably three or four type of scenarios you might encounter. Uh, a mobile hip that's painful with without a leg-leg discrepancy, or you may have a stiff painful hip with without a leg-leg discrepancy, or it's painless but stiff Again, with without leg length discrepancies. I'm talking predominantly about the, the proximal femur at the moment. Clearly, you need to correlate all this with the acetabulum as well as part of that, and that's part of uh, a talk still to come. In doing proximal femoral osteotomies, you need to think about all these different aspects before you do your osteotomy. What is the weight bearing surface area, congruency, and quality of the cartilage within the joint that you're dealing with, and can you improve that? What is the head sphericity and congruency? Are there any limitations to range of movement? What are the causes of these, intra-articular, extra-articular, and would you need to deal with those as part of doing your osteotomy, or is it going to prevent you from doing an osteotomy? What's the effect of your osteotomy on the abductors and flexor muscle powers? We've talked about measuring the neck shaft angle and the medial proximal femoral angles, and how is that going to change, how is the greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, and therefore the iliopsoas abductors going to change with your osteotomy? What level do we do the osteotomy? and also the mechanical axis overall of, of the limb. So we'll deal with some of these aspects as we go through. You heard about this map your ABCs, which is a mnemonic we use now in terms of limb reconstruction, which is measure at your, um, at your alignment, the MAD. You then have to look at the angles of your limb. You have to pick where the deformity is. You then select the apex of your deformity. You decide how and where you're going to cut the bone, and also how and where you're therefore going to correct using gradual, acute, plates, nails, whatever the case is going to be. But if we're going to map something, then we need to be, obviously image it and we need to measure things. And what do we measure? We measure, as you saw during the course, the neck shaft angle, either the medial or lateral proximal femoral angles, the alpha angle and head neck offset, which is to do with impingement, sphericity, and range of motion in the hip joint. You need to consider acetabular coverage, cartilage, and the weight-bearing surface area ratio, and also version or rotational profile. So we did this anatomical axis planning and we looked at the head neck center uh, giving us um, a medial proximal femoral angle and the neck shaft lines giving us a um, medial neck shaft angle uh, of 130 degrees, approximately normal. Also a mechanical axis planning with a lateral proximal femoral angle. But we also need to consider what happens in the rest of the limb lower down because often it's the mechanical axis you're trying to correct uh, and um, realign. And we know that we saw yesterday that a shaft deformity in the tibia femur can result in a malorientation of the joints above and below that deformity with without a secondary hidden deformity or compensatory deformity. So we need to consider the whole limb, not just the proximal femur. You need good quality standardized x-rays, which you talked about in the first day of this meeting, and correlate these with clinical assessment. And they have to be standardized in order to make the measurements you do of, uh, of meaningful. So if you've got a rotated hip, you can have changed the version of the hip, you're not going to be able to measure a neck shaft angle because it'll be varus or valgus. 
So what imaging do we get? Well, we look at standard AP hip neutral, that is the maximum profile of the hip joint to look at the neck shaft angle. You can look at frog leg laterals, done views to look at the, the offset, uh, offsets, cross table laterals, look at the head neck relationship. And functional view is important too to see what is the range of motion in this hip joint and what is the congruency going to be like after I've done my osteotomy between the head and the acetabulum. The more fancy imaging like digemeric scans looking at cartilage, MRI arthrograms and CT scans and also functional CT scans where you can simulate movement in the hip joint because impingement is not just a morphological abnormality that you see on x-ray because many people have them but it's a symptom in a patient who has impingement in certain situations positions so it's a range of movement induced impingement issue so this is an x-ray where you're going to look either focusing at the knee but including the rest of the femur or focusing at the hip including the rest of the femur to look and analyze the AP and lateral of a, of a femoral mechanical axis anatomical axis planning cross table laterals here we're focusing perpendicular to the proximal femur so this will give us sort of neck and proximal femoral abnormalities but obviously with divergence you won't see much distally in the femur. If you want to look at the head-neck relationship, you may want to look at this kind of view where the beam is directed perpendicular to the axis of the neck and that will give you neck-head deformity issues. Or you can use the Sugioka view which is another version of that and you can see there with the Sufi how clearly it, it demonstrates the deformity between the neck and the head where the, it's where the deformity occurs. James mentioned in his, um, uh, his talk just now about this proximal femoral physis, which often indicates the etiology of what the problem is. So coxivera tends to be developmental or congenital, occasionally fracture, whereas in neuromastic conditions you tend to have valgus of the hip joint, and that will reflect where the cora is or the apex of your deformity and your transverse bisector line. But you know that we talked about osteotomy rules, and osteotomy rule two was where we would rotate the axis at or on the correction plane or at the apex of deformity but the osteotomy had to be distal. And you see here with that physial line and the pathology in the proximal femur we can't do an osteotomy in the femoral head it has to be more distal and so if we're doing an osteotomy down here this is the osteotomy level you'll see that is the amount of translation that you're going to be requiring in order to realign the axes. So if you didn't know that and did osteotomy rule 3 and did an opening wedge osteotomy you'll see here that you get translation of your mechanical axis after, or your axis afterwards and you still get malorientation of both the proximal and distal joints. So more correctly, if you did an overcorrection of that with the same effect which what people did in order to get a normal proximal femoral angle, you still have abnormalities of both the proximal and distal mechanical axes. So more correctly, if you're doing a valgus osteotomy, you want to translate. Where do you want to translate? You want to translate laterally because with the head going more medial with the valgus, you end up with a medial mechanical axis deviation to compensate, you translate laterally uh, in the femur. So you do a lateral, a lateral translation. And you may want to fix it with whatever device you like, but that's an example of what you do. Uh, this one over here is my preference for doing this. You do get some leg lengthening. If you don't want leg lengthening, you can take the wedge out over here and you get less leg lengthening. But you note the translation so that your axis lines are realigned with a normal proximal and normal distal joint orientation angles. If we've got a valgus deformity, you see where the, core, the apex of deformity is, you see the bisector line, we're doing a various osteotomy, but because we can do it above the lesser trochanter, we're quite close to our correction plane, so the amount of translation is going to be fairly small with a various osteotomy, but it does have other effects. When you're doing your planning, if you do your head trochanter line, neck shaft line, and axial line, you'll notice that for a normal neck shaft angle of 130 degrees, this angle up here is 85, which means that this inner triangle angle here is 45 degrees. And that's quite important to know because whether we have coxivalga or coxivera, it remains 45 degrees. So this is a constant relationship in a normal, in a hip, between the trochanteric head center line and the neck shaft line and we can use that as a technique when you're doing an osteotomy. So if you drive a pin trochanter center femoral head, which is reasonably easy to do, if you drive a second pin up the neck at an angle of 45 degrees, slightly more difficult because you're going up a cylinder, and you can see an example there. If I then insert my blade plates along that second pin line, 
I can choose whatever angle I like in terms of the blade plate and that will determine exactly how much correction I get. I can do my osteotomy above or below this trochanter, do my translation and I'll end up again with a normalized neck shaft angle and a 45 degree um, normal angle as we have in a normal hip. So it's quite an easy way of doing an osteotomy of varus valgus. But recall also that we have abnormalities in the sagittal plane. And if you're doing flexion or extension osteotomies, that equally, although it's slightly less important in the sagittal plane because of the modified mechanical axis we talked about, you still also will have to either translate anteriorly or posteriorly, although it's less important. What is important is that if you do a varus valgus osteotomy, you'll notice a change in the center of the femoral head. So with the valgus, you get lengthening, the varus, you get shortening, but you also get a change in the head center trochanteric distance, which can influence your abductor muscle functions, and clearly also changes the mechanical axis. Rotation also will have an influence on the extensor and also abductor muscle function of the abductors because of changes in lever arms. So if you're doing rotation in combination with varus and valgus, think about what's happening to the abductor muscles. Here we have a combination of a distal varus deformity in the femur, but rotation in the proximal femur. So you see that the center head distance here has changed, and you can measure that and work out where it should be. If you derotated it, this is where the head center would be, as opposed to that up there. What you then have to do is a degree of what we call reverse planning, which was mentioned yesterday, and we'll go over again just now, is you have to say, okay, well, where is the head center going to be after my derotation osteotomy? You then plan your deformity in the distal part of the limb from the new head center that you, that you have to, that, to the core down here, so that when you then do go back and you do your osteotomy, you do your derotation, now the head center is in the position which you planned it to be, not where it was, you can then do a correct osteotomy distally with a normalized mechanical axis. But what happens to the iliosos, the less trochanter we're doing these osteotomies? So if we have a, a varus deformity and we're doing a valgus osteotomy, we know that with the valgus osteotomy you will lengthen the leg and you have to laterally translate. So if we do it below the less trochanter, we will relax the iliosos, which may be a good thing if there's a contracture, but it may also weaken the iliosos to some degree. If you do it above the lesser trochanter, you will see that you will both lengthen and laterally translate, so you will tension the iliosos, that you may end up with a contracture um, after the operation. So think about what happens to the iliosos. It's less of a problem with a varus osteotomy because varus osteotomy shorten the leg. You have a medial translation which tends to um, offload the iliosos, so you get much less effect on the iliosos, the varus osteotomy, but clearly with the varus osteotomy you're going to have an effect on the abductor muscle function. So the trochanter is going to rise up, therefore you're going to shorten your, your uh, abductors. We know the abductor function is related both to tension the muscle, which is the length, as well as the offset, which is the lever arm effect, in terms of your osteotomy. So you may have to do retensioning by doing not only an osteotomy, but a lateralization and or distalization of your greater trochanter to normalize your abductor muscle function. So we can look at, if you're doing planning, and there's some um, planning in your workbooks, which we won't be doing now, but you can look at them. There are sort of three scenarios. Um, in terms of the neck shaft angle and medial proximal femoral angle. So they can both be abnormal, but to the same degree, or you can have a normal neck shaft angle and an abnormal medial proximal femoral angle, or you can have both being abnormal, but to a different degree. So if we look at the situation, we have an abnormal lateral proximal femoral angle here, but a normal neck shaft angle. The trochanter is the, is the issue. If you transfer the trochanter, then we've normalized the lateral proximal femoral angle and we still have a normal neck shaft angle. So a simple trochanteric transfer might well be all that is needed. Here we have both are abnormal, the neck shaft angle as well as the medial proximal femoral angle we measured this time, both abnormal but to the same degree compared to the other side, and so that the whole of the proximal femoral fragment, trochanter ahead neck, can be osteotomized, readjusted, again to normalize the neck shaft angle and the medial proximal femoral angle. Here we have a, a situation where we have both abnormal neck shaft angle and medial proximal femoral angle, but the degree to which they are different and have changed is different. Consequently, we have a different way of dealing with this. You can do this osteotomy, which means that you get a normalish neck shaft angle, but you still have an abnormal medial proximal femoral angle, 
you can overcorrect the osteotomy to give you a normal medial proximal femoral angle, but then you get an abnormal neck shaft angle. And you do change the orientation of the head relative to the acetabulum, and we'll come to that. Or what you can do is to normalize the neck shaft angle and transfer the trochanter, in which case both come then for into a normal range. You have an osteo a situation where you have a high right trochanter, abnormal neck shaft angle, abnormal medial proximal femoral angle, and a short neck. So you want to do an, o an osteotomy that's going to address the trochanter, the neck shaft angle, and the neck length. So here we do what's called a Morsh osteotomy. You osteotomize the trochanter and the neck at a 136 degree angle. You can then slide the shaft laterally, reattach the trochanter in this, re in this region, and normalize the neck shaft angle and the medial proximal femoral angle. And these two osteotomies, this one you saw, which we call a Wagner osteotomy, you get a change in the relationship, the orientation of the head relative to the acetabulum, which may be something desirable, or may mean that if you've got an abnormality in the acetabulum, you also have to do an acetabular procedure on top of that. In this osteotomy, the Morsha osteotomy, the relationship between the head and the acetabulum remain the same. So if that's congruent and you like what that shape is and the way it brings surface area, then you don't, you don't change that and you can do a Morsha osteotomy. So here's an example of a high right trochanter. We have a normal neck shaft angle but a slightly short neck. So you can do an osteotomy where you do a relative neck lengthening and trochanteric transfer. This here we have both a high trochanter, a short neck, and an abnormal neck shaft angle. So this is the Morsha osteotomy where you do your cut at 130 degrees, 130 degree blade plate, transfer laterally, transfer the trochanter. And she also had an acid public problem, um, as you see here. So she had a dome Chiari osteotomy on top of that as well. We do functional range of motion imaging preoperatively and also clinic examination to look at issues of contracture, short and tight muscles. So if you have a various deformity of 30 degrees here and you want to do a valgus osteotomy, you check adduction. If you have 30 degrees adduction, you do your osteotomy, your, heg, your leg is neutrally aligned. If your adductors are tight, then you can always do an adductor tenotomy in order to get abduction. But if you've got a various deformity and you want to, again, of 30 degrees, and you only have 10 degrees of adduction, but you do a 30 degree osteotomy, you can end up with tightness, contracture of your abductors. You may get an abductor contracture, which you'd have to use either surgery or physiotherapy uh, to realign that. Often it does come out because the lever arm effect in physiotherapy, you can stretch out uh, the abductor muscles. So I think it's important, and we'll hear from the joint replacement surgeons later on, but if you are going to do hip reconstruction, then you need to be thinking about things that they don't like you to do. And this is something, advice we got from the recent BISCOS meeting about looking at what to do and what not to do. So they say think in 3D, but also 4D, that is time. How long is your operation going to last? How much, how much are you going to buy the patient in terms of time before hip replacement is required? Remember the power to weight ratio. Don't damage your abductors because they're important for joint replacement. You need to preserve the diaphysis. Don't use titanium, particularly titanium screws, and leave them broken off inside the shaft. Anywhere else, preferably remove metal wear, but don't remove it if you're going to damage or cause defects uh, in the, the, the shaft. So if you're going to reconstruct, I think it's important to remember that you're trying to improve the weight-bearing surface area congruency in order to protect the cartilage. At the moment in time, our cartilage-preserving techniques are not good enough to also reconstruct the cartilage. You need to maintain or establish your range of motion, so you need to check that preoperatively. You need to maintain and or improve your abductor muscle or flexor muscle functions without compromising hip replacement. Thank you.